Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm going to do it from up here. The, this morning's lesson has a, just a ton of verses. And instead of me just kind of saying them and if we flip around to it, I'll put most of them on to, on the slides so we can kind of do it that way. So I thought it would actually be a little easier so I can kind of see where I'm at and not be spinning around and trying to figure out if I click at the right place and not the right place. But this morning we're going to talk about kind of the warnings that, that the Proverbs have about about the mindset of laziness or the being lazy. So I'm going to first start off, though, starting to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to read kind of a little bit of an introduction verse here from, from 2 Thessalonians. But as I, as I think about just some of the people that have kind of I've been exposed to in my life, I was surrounded by people growing up they were kind of the complete opposite of, of lazy. I mean, you think about some of the people that, that maybe you had in your life. I, I, can, I can think about my grandmother who, at the age of, I think, 45, became a widow. Had four children, some of them still in high school. And what she had to do to just keep her family together was completely... Self-driven, motivated, every day, got to get it done. I can think about other people in that generation, the people that I looked up to as, as, a, as a child. And I think those are the things that kind of instilled in me, kind of where we think about counteracting some of these qualities that we're going to see about people that, that Solomon says here about the lazy, or what we should strive to, what we should aspire to. Even this past weekend, when we were back in uh, Indiana with Jessica's uh, mom and dad, he was like, let's go out and cut some wood. That's great. And so we're out there, and we're hauling big logs and stuff like that, and we bring it up to the splitter, and Jessica's dad is, I think, 74. We couldn't get him out and away from the front of the splitter. He kept splitting those logs until, until we were completely done. We had... As we drove up, there were already like four piles of wood sitting there stacked, and we created a, another one. But he ran that splitter until it ran out of gas. We had to get, we had flashlights out there. It was like 8 30, 9 o'clock at night. We had flashlights so we could see. But just thinking about how much he would just, this is what he does, this is what you do. So I think that's what I want to think about today. It's like, we're going to talk about what, what, what does Proverbs talk about laziness, but it's like, on the flip side, it also talks about working and being industrious and being diligent in our lives. So let's start off with 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning in verse number 6. Now I command you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus, that you keep away from a brother who is walking in idleness, and not according to the traditions that you receive for us. For you yourselves know you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor do we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we work night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have the right, but we give you and ourselves an example to imitate. So we see here Paul warning the church in Thessalonica, hey, keep away from these people that, that aren't doing what they need to do. He's like, even though we had the right to not have to work and we could have just used you to support us, he's like, we wanted to be an example to you into how we should live and how we should work. And not to be lazy, not to do things that are idle, not to just glom onto things that are given to us. So I think that's kind of the framework as, as we look about what, what does Proverbs then say about one who is who's looked at as lazy. So we're going to flip over into Proverbs. I'm going to read a couple different passages here, and then we're going to click through and have some more specific things. These first ones are more higher, overarching things that are going to be pretty, likely pretty familiar than some verses that we've heard before. First off is Proverbs chapter 6. We're going to begin in verse 6 and read down through verse 11. Proverbs chapter 6, beginning in verse 6, says, Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider your ways and be wise. Without having a chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. 
How long will you lie there, O slugger? And when you will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber, and want like an armed man. We see here this comparison between this industrious person and the thought of looking at the ant as an example of being industrious there, where every different ant is kind of doing their job, right? It says without a chief, a ruler, or an officer, kind of they're doing the work. They prepare in the summer, prepare when the time to be preparing is. They gather their food in the harvest time compared to then the slugger who is like, are you going to get up? Are you going to get up from your sleep? Um, you're just sitting there laying there. And it says, ultimately, the results there will be poverty, and it will come upon you. Let's also turn over to Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 4 says, A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of a diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is prudent, son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. Again, kind of this comparison and contrasting between those who are working when it's time to work versus hanging out and just kind of letting things happen around them. The final kind of overarching verse I want to look at this morning is Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24, beginning in verse 30 says, I passed by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. And behold, it was all overgrown with thorns, and the ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. Then I saw and considered it. it looked, I looked and received instruction, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber. And want like an armed man. We see these kind of the same phrases over and over again. This 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 notion that hey, if you're gonna just hang out and sleep and not do your work, you're gonna be poor. You're gonna have to want. You're gonna not be able to do the things that need to be done. I think it's interesting as we think about in the time of, of Proverbs, it, it took a lot of work and diligence and stuff just to just to go and have something to eat. And I think that's something that we can just hop over to Schnooks and say, hey, I want something. We don't need to do all this pre preparation and things like that. But I think as we look at these three kind of overarching ones, it really highlights this thought of this, this contrasting thing that it, it's these small things that maybe we look at. It's, it's just the, the, it's like, hey, why are you sleeping when you should be working? Why are you doing these things? So I want to look this morning about, let's see, I've got six different kind of these marks of what it looks like to be lazy. And again, there's, there's several different verses I'm going to read from this, and then hopefully we're going to have some kind of discussion about kind of these characteristics and a little bit about what that might impact to us. So the first one, I'm calling these marks of the lazy, is the inability to really get started. Uh, we see, we saw this same kind of thing in some of these other verses that we've already read, where it's you're, you're kind of there, and it's like it's time to do what you need to be do, need to needs to be being done, but you're just sitting there and you're, you're sleeping instead. Proverbs chapter 24 or 21 continues this idea: the desire of the sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labor all day long. He craves and craves, but the righteous gives and does not hold back. So you see this notion of the desire there is, 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 is he wants to do it, but again, his hands are refusing to labor. He wants these things, but does not seek after to do them. The next mark I want to look at this morning is, is un unable to stick to a task to conclusion. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 24, the sluggard buries his hand in the dish and will not even bring it back to his mouth. Again, the same, same concept there in verse 20, chapter 25, verse 15 that, that is brought out. It's this notion of the sluggard not even willing to kind of finish the task of 
eating, right? He, he puts his hand in the dish and is like, oh, I can't even have the energy to bring it up to my mouth to, to eat. This notion of God, really not sticking to these tasks. We're just kind of bouncing around, not really working to conclusion. Full of excuses. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 4. The sluggard does not plow in the autumn. He will seek at harvest and have nothing. It's interesting. It's like, why? what does that really have to do? Because in, a lot of times in the harvest time it is a time to be making preparations. But it's also, it's, this is kind of the time of year, right? It's a little chilly. Really not be kind of hanging out in the fields working when it's cold and I'll just, I'll just do it later. I'll figure it out later. But what, what the proverb is, is highlighting here is you come back and you won't get the harvest that you should have had because you didn't do the preparation because, oh, it's too cold. Or the slugger said, there's a lion outside. I should be killed in the streets. It's, it's too dangerous. I can't do what I should be doing because it's, there's something else going on. This one is a, is a one that I think is very dangerous for us all. It talks about success and desires, but ultimately it's not really doing it. The soul of the slugger craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Proverbs 14 and 23 says, In all toil there is profit, but mere talk only leads to poverty. The desire of the slugger kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. All day long he craves and craves, but the righteous gives and does not hold back. And finally, the, the last one here is full of advice. Him this quote unquote full of advice. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. We see people that in our lives today are just full of advice, but if you start to kind of peel back, is there any structure or anything behind it? There's several, several different things we talked about there in all these verses. But what I wanted to spend a little bit of time here this morning, though, is how do these types of things impact our relationship together? And how do they also impact maybe our spiritual development and our spiritual relationship? So first of all, what are your thoughts on how if a person is kind of exhibiting these characteristics, how does that impact us as a relationship together with one another? Ed? Well, as a church, uh, you know, we're all bound to do this, basically. <clears throat> so the work gets done here. You have to be, you have, each of us got to step up and do a part. And uh, if you're not self motivated and care about the group, um, it's going to function the way we're supposed to. Things don't get done. I think if, if, if collectively we all have some of those same attitudes, you think about what, what would even happen to our ability to come here together, right? I'm interested that Ed just said that self-motivated thing. Because when, whenever uh, he and Mark were interviewing Bryce about this time last year, that was one of the questions that Ed asked him about. Are you a self-starter? Are you self-motivated? And I'm back in Proverbs 6 right now. And the thing about the ant in verse 7 is, yeah. without having any chief or officer or ruler. Right. And it's the idea of, don't sit around and wait for somebody to tell you what to do. Or have to have like a taskmaster over you to go.
No, I think you're you're 100 percent right because I think one of the things I think there's a is a risk for for us all is like hey. When, I'm, when I click into work mode for my job, I can just go, 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 and do, and do around the house, and we're getting it done. But if I neglect, if I don't have that same level of industriousness when it comes to my spiritual growth, I think that's the part that, as I started to read these and, and kind of take them out of the context of just doing my job and doing my work, if I don't have that same level of push and drive for my spiritual growth, I think that's where we start to kind of see slippage, right? And, and, and what does that then mean to, to our spiritual lives and our spiritual growth? think about God's want for us, right? He wants us to be able to work in his kingdom. He wants us and to, to stand up and provide the, the guidance for our families. He wants us to provide a safe place in this world for us to come together. And I think that you're right. It's, it, if, if we're we're not being industrious and we're being lazy in our spiritual kind of development that's going to lead us to kind of undoneness and I think we'll talk about it here in a few minutes I think that's where one of the the, the consequences right you, then the world sees that in our own life they see it maybe in our in our personal actions or they see it in they see this kind of off balanceness right you're really focused on this, but you're not focused on your relationship and building it towards God. Lisa? Well, the way starts in the heart. You know, even a physical behavior, whether you're motivated to go do, do someone's dishes because they had you over to eat or whatever, you know, all that stuff's going to start from the heart. It won't start any other way. That's why we put it to examine ourselves daily in the Word. And you know, in 2 Samuel, the story of Bathsheba, we kind of would focus on her. Because to me, the whole key is in 2 Samuel 11, 2, he got up off the couch and went up on the roof yeah. and looked around. Yeah. And right there, it tells the right. entire. I need to click my, my next grouping here because I've got timestamps on my thing if we're going to get done. Appreciate all the comments. I think what we're starting to look at, too, is, is these, these ideas are very blending together. So I want to continue on. And some of this is what I've called the consequence of laziness. And I think we, we've seen this is the first one is you're going to suffer for want. And again, I think it, it, as I first put these on paper and started to look at this, I was really thinking about the physical aspects of our lives and stuff like that. But I want to also kind of look at the spiritual piece uh, of this as well. Suffers from what slothfulness casts into a deep sleep. An idle person will suffer hunger. Again, not just physical hunger, but think about spiritual hunger as well. We've read this already, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands and rest. Poverty will come to you like a robber. Whoever land, works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits will have plenty of of poverty. This lack idea of being frustrated by the lack of progress, right? The soul of the slayer craves and gets nothing, right? This, this, I, I'm, I want all this stuff, but if I'm not doing it, I'm not going to get there. The way of the slugger is like a hedge of thorns. The path of the upright is a level highway, right? You think about this, this, this idea of you're walking down this path and it's just full of thorns and bushes and things that are all unkempt. But to see a person who is diligent and upright, it's a nice, even walkway. It's a path that's well prepared. 
Failure is noticed by others. This is the one where Mark just highlighted this, right? It, it's things that if we're not doing, we're going to be noticed by others. Like this talks about having our, our house being overgrown with thorns and ground is covered with nettles. Our wall is broken down. Again, all this person is really looking for is sleep and slumber and rest and not really looking to this. And finally, the last one, one of the consequences there is ultimately you, you lose your independence. The hand of the diligent will rule, but the slothful will be forced into labor. So thinking about some of these consequences, right? We're going to suffer from one. We're going to be fr frustrated with the lack of progress. We're going to be noticed by our failures by others and ultimately lose our independence. What are both some short-term and long-term consequences of, of a lazy lifestyle. And this one I really want to heighten in our discussion around our spiritual uh, uh, lives, right? I think the one thing, as I think about today, and maybe it's because I'm a father, I've got children that are starting to move on to that next phase of life. And did I do enough to prepare them spiritually for them to then stand on their own? I mean, that's, that's the thing that kind of that, that, talk about things that will kind of keep you up at night. Those are some things that as, as you start to have children that are like, all right, we're, I don't have this like, oh, they're in the house and they just texted me and they're, they're in bed. And they're, I don't know where they are. They're, I probably can figure it out. They're still on Life 360, but um, try not to snoop too much. But what about the consequences of laziness? One of the things that I think of both, both physically and spiritually with that mindset is the time is short. If you wait and start thinking about, oh, I'll get to those types of lessons and those kinds of discussions later, well, later becomes less and less opportunity. I think both in teaching our families, but also in, in building ourselves up. I think as we think about this suffering from want. I mean, how many times do we look around and see, I don't feel like I've got that aspect working well in my life. I don't, I, I see others that are excelling in some certain facet in their spiritual life. Does that drive us then to, to action? I think that first point, and to say, oh yeah, I'm a lazy person. I mean, even the Proverbs say, you typically don't self-identify like that. But I, I'm thinking about the different symptoms that might accompany that. And I immediately think of covetousness. You know, other people have something that I want and there's a jealousy about that. And then it also leads to complaining. And so I might not be someone to sit down and, and self-identify as lazy for a day, but I can notice my like inner thoughts complaining and bickering that other people have something that I don't have. And to answer your question more specifically about spiritual things, I can very easily go into the, well, you know, I wasn't raised learning certain things and I wasn't brought up that way. So that's why my Bible isn't as colorful as some other people's highlightings or that's why my time periods aren't as memorized as another person. When in reality, my response should be, okay, time to get out the flashcards. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's, it's also like this flat, frustrated with the lack of progress, right? It's like, but looking at somebody else and like, oh, why don't I have that? Well, instead of looking inwardly, I think there's also like procrastination really kind of can really take hold. Like, that's really easy. It's like, I'll get to it later. It's going to be it's, it's there, it's to do, I'll figure it out, and I'll be able to get it done. I think in our spiritual life, if we, if, we, if we treat our spiritual life with that type of mentality, we're not gonna be as strong of, of a person spiritually as God would want us to be. I think what that's gonna be is, then how are we going? Are we setting goals for ourselves? Are we looking inwardly towards objectives that I should be achieving. This is very interesting as we kind of come to the close of the year, right? I, on, 
On Friday afternoon, my whole afternoon was spent going through performance reviews for my team. And it's very interesting. We, 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 we set these goals and objectives at the beginning of the year. And at the end of the year, it's like, well, look at all the stuff I did. And I'm like, well, look at all the stuff we didn't do. Like, but if you don't set the right level of goals for ourselves, spiritual goals, spiritual goals what, what are we doing? What are we, what are we thinking? How am I going to show progress in our lives if I don't even think about what I should be showing progress towards? I think those are some things as we kind of think about the new year. It's definitely something that what, what, what can I do? And I think the one thing that as, as I've had different team members on my team is the very young and very new from, from, uh, from right out of school or very new to us, don't set these like grandiose, unachievable things that, that you're going to be frustrated with. What are some of those small things that you can slowly build? What are those daily things that you can do? What are those, those minor things in, in the grand scheme of things that I can add to my daily work to really show progress and show action towards God's world? You can't come back up here where I was at. Sure. The measurable improvement or small goals is our daily Bible reading that's out there. If you don't read the Bible every day, there's a really good plan that you can do that. And how long does it take you? Like less than 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah 10 to 15 minutes. Somebody would say, oh, that's not really, I can hear it already. Church attendance is not really your soul. No, but those are measurable, small steps yep. and measurable steps that you can take to move in the right direction. And in the world of, uh, of goal setting, those will become a, a little bit kind of leading indicators, right? It, it's going it, to, it may be something that, hey, what, what, what is the outcome of me being together, not just not just in the building, I think that's the other part. Not just in the building, but, but together with our church family on more occasions. I think, too, it, it, it's also start small, right? If, if it's just read a chapter a day, and that's what the, the current kind of, it's, it's one to two chapters per day. I mean, don't try to go and I'm going to read the whole Bible in two months, right? It, it, it is achievable, but I think to start doing something. I think it's also great with the group chat, right? It's, um, a lot of times I, I see items come through and right it's, it's a little bit of a spark and it's really uh, an energizing moment when you kind of read that like what somebody else is thinking about those things and it's a great way to kind of recenter on what's truly important this is something that i think that, that came up with this. and so what does it really mean to be a worker and to be industrious and i think the number one thing that i put is this be a self-starter being diligent, really to, to, to get it done, not depending on somebody else to push you, right? The, 
the the idea here in, in chapter six is what Ryan spoke about is it's the ant doesn't have this ruler and taskmaster and it's like it innately knows what to do. I think that's what in our lives, in our physical actions, in and what needs to get done, what can I do, but also what can I do in my spiritual life to to motivate myself, not asking somebody else to say, hey, have you done this? Let's turn over to Proverbs chapter 31. Right? I think we this is a great example. I was trying to figure out a place where we can really dive into Proverbs chapter 31 in our in our studies and I don't have a really good spot for it to fit, but certainly in, in looking at this kind of idea, um, we see the actions of the, the industrious woman very much highlighted in this actions. In Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 13 says, she seeks wool and flax with, with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it with the fruit of her hands, plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arm strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold to the spindle. <clears throat> she opens her hands to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all of her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself, and her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and teaches, uh, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. You see there in all those things, she is both looking for opportunities and taking those opportunities to provide not just minimalistic things to her household, but greatness and honor and 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 scarlet and purple and linen and all these things that are so much. We think about being a diligent self-starter. I think that's something as we inwardly look into our lives, we need to figure out what can be done. What should I do? What can I do? And I think the next item here I want to look at is it's getting the work done when it needs to be done. Here in Proverbs chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, it says, A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. When it's time to go, it's time to go. In, this, in the, the, the worker who is diligent in the harvest time ultimately will be rewarded. Proverbs 13 and verse 4 the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. We see in 22 and verse 29, do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. This reward notion of those who are industrious and those who are working before the Lord, we see the value of hard work and diligence being paid off in both getting the job done, but also then being rewarded for a job well done. So how we see these connections, what are some things in our lives that we can work on creating this diligence, this self-starting, this, this idea of getting the work done and a hardworking spirit? What are some things that we can do in our own lives to cultivate that and push that forward to the next step?
naturally woke up before all of them. I mean, I'm sure it was a routine. Um, I don't know the ancient equivalent to an alarm clock, but I'm sure it was <laughs> practice for her. Something. Um, while everyone else just, you know, the, the time will come, I'll get that done when I have the time for it, but you know, she's going to add extra hours to her day. For me, it's, it's understanding, uh, coupling the self-starter with, with laziness. The, the difference between with a self-starter and a lazy person is they know when to rest and where their rest comes from. This entire time I've been you know, trying to gather up all these New Testament examples of rest, and every single one of them is you find rest in God, you find rest in Christ. In Matthew 12, it talks about, come to me, all you labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, um, and you will find rest in your souls. You'll find that also um, all throughout Hebrews and Second Thessalonians, all these places where the rest is is in God. And we talk about all the you know studying and everything and how it is rejuvenated. That's where we find our rest. And um, even take an example from God. God took His rest in creation when the work was done. So we have to, to be a self-starter, know when our rest is, when the time to rest is, and where we find that rest. Okay. I mean, I think it also <clears throat> entails just really, it's almost a test of your faith, and you just really need to stay focused on the Lord, because the devil just wants to throw all kinds of distractions at us. He wants us to procrastinate. He wants us to be discouraged. And you think about, like, back to your comment about your children. I mean, just raising children alone, you think the faith that's necessary, you know, from the moment of even conception, that you realize, okay, you know, as a woman, I'm pregnant, of, you know, doing the right things for my body, you know, taking care of my body, trusting the Lord is going to protect this baby and me and, you know, have a safe, healthy delivery all the way, you know, throughout life. I mean, that takes an enormous amount of faith. And if you're not grounded and centered in the Lord, I don't know how people do it. Um, but, I mean, the devil just wants to throw. He wants to do all kinds of things to just get us off track. And, I mean, that's why I think seek, it's, it's a test of faith. It's like, okay, I'm going to trust you, God. And you turn to God and you ask him for the wisdom and the direction. And what do you want me to do here? Even just like we were talking about rest, just to have the physical strength, you know, I mean, you think about everything going on in the world and just, just the strength to just to, to not pay attention to those distractions and to stay focused and to have the mental clarity that's necessary to make good decisions. So. Yeah, I think, too, one of the things just thinking through this also is, is how do these how, did, how does being industrious and, and working and then working together, it plays not only in our relationship with God, but in our relationship with each other. I think the most time that I've built strong relationships with people, physical relationships with people, is when, when you're doing something and you're accomplishing something. You're something that you're put to a task that's very challenging that, that, that you have to struggle against. Well, what if we think about that in a spiritual context, things that we are struggling against that are outside these four walls, right? We're all struggling. Let's not struggle independently. How can we struggle and, and work on those together as a, as a family? I like your word struggle. I think that somebody could easily disagree with me about this, and that's fine. I think this might be an opinion instead of a fact. But I hate the concept of motivation and like the principle of what motivates me and what drives me and I need to feel the feel thing. I would like to completely get rid of the word motivation and replace it with discipline. And just doing it because you have to do it yeah. and I'm disciplined. And that's, how, I, that's what I'm thinking of with the struggle of being together as a family. If I wait, if I wait until I feel like doing it, it's not going to get done. Sure. Because I'm not going to feel like doing it. I just need to do it. Sure.
I think it's really easy in our lives to, there, there's always something that can be an excuse. There's always something that can get in our way. There's always something, some obstacle that I can't get past it. What, what if, what if I can't, uh, think about when, when Moses and God were just after the burning bush and God's like, you got to go back to Egypt. You got to talk to people. He's like, Ugh. but what if they can't do that? Like, I can't talk well. I can't do this. I can't do this. And God's like, I'm going to give you this, I'm going to give you this. And he's like, well, what if they don't believe me? He's like, well, what do you have in your hand? He's like, I got a staff. Well, well, that's what we're going to use. We're going to use the staff to show people. So then what is then, what's in your hand? What's in my hand? What are the things that we can do, each of us, that we already have, we're already something that we can do, right? We talk about different tasks or different different spiritual gifts and different things that we all can do, right? It, it's not just a series of things that, oh, I can go sign up for. What are those intangible things that we can do? If you look at into Titus chapter, Titus chapter 3, right at the very end of, of his uh, letter there to Titus, he says, and let our people, in verse 14, 314, let our people learn to devote themselves to good work. So as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. If you rewind and go look back one chapter in Titus chapter 2, it's a great view of things that need to be done, right? Teaching others, the older men teaching the younger men, the, young, the older women teaching the younger women, and, and how to not just act and behave, but also to, to provide and do and build up the family. I think we can also find what are those opportunities where I can show love towards others? And where are those opportunities where I can show love for God? So just like God's challenge back to Moses, what's in your hand? What's at hand for you to do right now? What are some small things that we can do to show what God's working in us and through us?